Hi, it's Marie from Still Dreaming Homestead. Well, I realized that yesterday I said the wrong date on my uh, video. So today is Tuesday, July 26. We're starting a new book, the second book in the series by Laura Ingalls Wilder, and it's called Farmer Boy. Now, this is about Amonzo Wilder and his growing up. He grew up in New York State on a large farm. And he had a brother and some sisters, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to begin reading that. The first one is called School Days. Here's the picture they show. All right, school days. It was January in northern New York State, 67 years ago. Well, now, of course, it's, it's way over 100 years ago. Snow lay deep everywhere. It loaded the bare limbs of the oaks, maples, and beeches. It bent the green boughs of the cedars and spruces down into the drifts. Those are evergreen trees. Billows of snow covered the fields and stone fences. Have you ever seen a stone fence? They're beautiful. Down a long road through the woods, a little boy trudged to school with his big brother, Royal, and his two sisters, Eliza, Jane, and Alice. Royal was 13 years old, Elijah, Jane, 12, and Alice, 10. Amonzo was the youngest of all, and this was his first go year of going to school because he was not quite nine years old yet. You see, they started going to school later than we do now. Now, uh, five years old is very common, sometimes even four. He had to walk fast to keep up with the others and he had to carry the dinner pail. Now, we would call that lunch, most of us but they called it din dinner there. And the last meal of the day, they called supper. Royal ought to carry it, he said. He's bigger than I be. Royal strode ahead, big and manly in boots, and Elijah Jane said, no, Manzo, it's your turn to carry it now because you're the littlest. Elijah Jane was bossy. She always knew what was best to do, and she made a Manzo and Alice do it. Amonzo hurried behind Royal, and Alice hurried behind Elijah Jane in the deep paths made by the bobsled runners. On each side, the soft snow was piled high. The road was down a long slope, then it crossed a little bridge and went on for a mile through the frozen woods to the schoolhouse. The cold nipped Amonzo's eyelids and numbed his nose. But inside his good woolen clothes, he was warm. They were all made from the wool of his father's sheep. His underwear was creamy white, but mother had dyed the wool for his outside clothes. Butternut holes had dyed the thread for his coat and, <coughs> sorry, and his long trousers. Then mother had woven it and she had soaked and shrunk the cloth into a heavy, thick, full cloth. Not wind, nor cold, or even a drenching rain could go through the good full cloth that mother made. For Amonzo's waist, she had dyed fine wool, as red as a cherry, and she had woven a soft, thin cloth. It was light and warm and beautifully red. Amonzo's long brown pants buttoned to his red waist with a row of brass, bright brass buttons all around his middle. The waist collar buttoned snugly up against his chin, and so did his long coat of brown full cloth. Mother had made his cap of the same brown full cloth with cozy ear flaps that go down over your ears to keep the cold out that tied under his chin, and his red mittens were on a string that went up his 
the sleeves of his coat and across the back of his neck. That way he wouldn't lose them. He wore one pair of socks pulled snugly over the legs of his underdrawers and another pair outside the legs of his long brown pants and he wore moccasins. They were exactly like the moccasins the Indians wore. So when it was talking about underwear there, it was talking about what we call long johns. So it would be almost like pajama pants. Girls tied heavy veils over their faces when they went out in the winter. But Amanza was a boy and his face was out in the frosty air. His cheeks were red as apples and his nose was redder than a cherry. And after he'd walked a mile and a half, he was glad to see the schoolhouse. It stood lonely in the frozen woods at the foot of Hard Scramble Hill. Smoke was rising from the chimney and the teacher had shoveled a path through the snowdrifts to the door. Five big boys were scuffling in the deep snow by the path. Amanza was frightened when he saw them. Royal pretended not to be afraid, but he was. They were the big boys from Hard Scramble, the Hard Scramble settlement, and everyone was afraid of them. They smashed little boys' sleds just for fun. They'd catch a little boy and swing him by his legs and let him go head first into the deep snow. Sometimes it made two little boys fight each other even though the boys didn't want to fight and begged to be let off. Those big boys were 16 or 17 years old and they came to school only in the middle of the winter term. They came to thrash, that means beat up, the teacher and break up the school. They boasted, which means bragged, that no teacher could finish the winter term in that school and no teacher ever had. This year, the teacher was a slim, pale young man. His name was Mr. Course. He was gentle and patient, and he never whipped little boys because they forgot how to spell a word. Amonzo felt sick inside when he thought how the big boys would beat Mr. Course. Mr. Course wasn't big enough to fight them. There was a hush in the schoolhouse and you could hear the noise that the big boys were making outside. The other pupils stood whispering together by the big stove in the middle of the room. Mr. Corse sat at his desk. One thin cheek rested on his slim hands, and he was reading a book. He looked up and said pleasantly, Good morning. Royal and Elijah Jane and Alice answered him patiently, politely. But Amonzo did not say anything. He stood by the desk looking at Mr. Corse. Mr. Corse smiled at him and said, Do you know I'm going home with you tonight? Amonzo was too troubled to answer. Yes, Mr. Corse said, it's your father's turn. Every family in the district boarded the teacher for two weeks. That means that they would go and stay with them and they would give them a place to sleep and food. He went from farm to farm till he stayed two weeks at each one. Then school was closed for that term. When he said this, Mr. Corse rapped on his desk with his ruler. It was time for school to begin. All the boys and girls went to their seats. The girls sat on the left side of the room and the boys sat on the right, with the big stove and the wood box in the middle between them. The big ones sat in the back seats. The middle ones sat in the middle seats and the little ones sat in the front seats. All the seats were the same size. The big boys could hardly get their knees under their desks and the little boys couldn't rest their feet on the floor. Amonzo and Miles Lewis were the prime, in the primer class. That's the very beginning class. So they sat on the very front seat and they had no desk. They had to hold their primers in their hands. Then Mr. Corse went to the window and tapped on it. The big boys clattered into the entry, jeering and laughing loudly. They burst the door open with a big noise and swaggered in.
and I'm going to show you what it looks like in their schoolroom. You see how they had the wood stove between them to keep them nice and warm? And you see how the little ones were in the front and the big ones in the back? Big Billy Ritchie was their leader. He was almost as big as Amonzo's father. His fists were as big as Amonzo's father's fists. He stomped the snow from his feet and noisily tramped to the back seat. The four other boys made noises. They could, all the noise they could. Mr. Course did not say anything. No whispering was permitted in school and, fit, and no fidgeting. Everyone must sit perfectly still and keep his eyes fixed on his lesson. Amonzo and Miles held up their primers and tried not to swing their legs. Their legs grew tired, so tired that they ached from dangling over the edges of the seat. Sometimes one leg would kick suddenly before Amonzo could stop it. Then he tried to pretend that nothing happened, but he could feel Mr. Corse looking at him. They had very strong rules then. In the back seat, the big boys whispered and scuffled and slammed their books. Mr. Corse said sternly, a little less disturbance, please. For a minute, they were quiet. Then they began again. They wanted Mr. Corse to try to punish them. When he did, all five of them would jump him. At last, the primer was called, and Amonzo could slide off the seat and walk with Miles to the teacher's desk. Mr. Kors took Amonzo's primer and gave them words to spell. When Royal had been in the primer class, he had often come home at night with his hands stiff and swollen. The teacher had bitten, bitten, beaten the palm of his hand with a ruler because Royal did not know his lessons. See, the palm, he would hit it with the ruler. And I got to tell you, it was a long time ago now. Oh my goodness, it was a long time ago. I was six, so 50 years ago. When I got in trouble at school in first grade, my teacher used my brand new wooden ruler to hit my hand. And you know what? The ruler broke. Well, it hurt, of course, but it really hurt my feelings because that was my new ruler. Back to the story. Then Ruler Father said, If a teacher has to thrash you again, Royal, I'll give you a thrashing you'll remember. But Mr. Corse never beat a little boy's hand with his ruler. When Amonzo could not spell a word, Mr. Corse said, Stay in at recess and learn it. At recess, the girls were let out first. They put on their hoods and cloaks. A cloak would be um, kind of like a coat, but it doesn't have sleeves. It just covers you. And quietly went outdoors. After 15 minutes, Mr. Corse rapped on the window and they came in, hung their wraps in the entry, and took their books again. Then the boys could go out for 15 minutes. They rushed out shouting in the cold. The first out began snowballing all the others. All that had sleds scrambled up hard scramble. Hill, hard scramble hill. They flung themselves stomach down on the sleds and swooped down the long steep slope. They upset in the snow and ran and wrestled and threw snowballs. Upset means they would tumble off their sleds. And they washed one another's face with snow. And all the time they yelled as loud as they could. When Amonzo had to stay in his seat at recess, he was ashamed because he was kept in with the girls. At noontime, everyone was allowed to move about the schoolroom and talk quietly. Elijah Jane opened the dinner pail on her desk. 
It held bread and butter and sausage, donuts and apples, and four delicious apple turnovers, their plump crusts filled with melting slices of apple and spicy brown juice. After Monzo had eaten every crumb of his turnover and licked his fingers, he took a drink of the water from the pail with a dipper in it on a bench in the corner. Then he put on his cap and coat and he mittens and he went out to play. The sun was shining almost overhead. All the snow was a dazzle of sparkles and the wood haulers were coming down hard scramble hill. High on the bobsleds piled with logs, the men cracked their whips and shouted to their horses and the horses shook jingles from their string of bells. All the boys ran shouting to fasten their sleds to the bobsled runners, and the boys who had not brought their sleds climbed up and rode on the log loads of wood. It was nice of those woodcutters to let them do that. They went merrily past the schoolhouse and down the road. Snowballs were flying thick. Up on the loads, the boys wrestled, pushing each other off into the deep drifts. Amonzo and Miles rode shouting on Miles' sled. It did not seem a minute since they'd left the schoolhouse, but it took much longer to go back. First they walked, then they trotted, then they ran, panting. They were afraid of being late. They knew that if they were late, Mr. Course would whip them. The schoolhouse stood silent. They did not want to go in, but they had to. They stole in quietly. That means they snuck in. Mr. Corse sat at his desk and all the girls were in their places pretending to study. On the boys' side of the room, every seat was empty. Monzo crept to his seat in that dreadful silence. He held up his primer and tried not to breathe so loud. Mr. Corse did not say anything. Billy Ritchie and the other big boys didn't care. They made all the noise they could. They were going, going to their seats. Mr. Corse waited until they were quiet. Then he said, I will overlook your tardiness this one time, but do not let it happen again. Everybody knew the big boys would be tardy again. Mr. Corse could not punish them because they would thrash him. And that's what they meant to do. Wow. Those older boys are just terrible. Well, that's the end of chapter one. I hope you liked it. I think this is going to be a really good story. And I'll be reading to you again tomorrow. All right. Bye-bye.